Hello, I am Glenn Hall. Today is March 28, 2023, and this video is called Let No One Seize Your Crown. Today I'm going to be teaching concerning Christ's letter to the Philadelphians, to the church at Philadelphia. We'll go to Revelation chapter 3. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. So that's how Jesus identifies himself to the church of Philadelphia. And the more that I study these letters, I see that there's very specific reasons as to why Jesus said certain things about who, who he was, what aspect of himself he was representing as he spoke to these people. Uh, and I think we really saw that last time with respect to the church in Sardis, where he identified himself as the one who has the seven spirits of God. Because we talked last time about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Today, the first thing he says is the words of the Holy One. That word is hagios in uh, Greek. And there's a particular word used often in the New Testament called hagiosmos, which is often translated sanctification. The word Hagios means holy. The word sanctification really means holiness. And so we are called to holiness. And so Jesus is identifying himself as the Holy One. The true one, the Holy One, the true one. Because one who is true, who is totally true, is holy. And he says he's the one who has the key of David, the one who opens and no one will shut, and shuts and no one opens. There's only one other place in Scripture where the key of David is mentioned. And we'll go to that. It's in Isaiah chapter 22. And it's very interesting because um, it turns out that, that this is a parable. And, well, as I've said before, all of Scripture is a parable, and I certainly did not understand this parable until about an hour ago as I was doing just final thinking and praying and preparation for doing this particular teaching. So in Isaiah 22, starting in verse 15, it says this, Thus says the Lord I am of hosts, Come, go to this steward, to Shebna, who is over the household, and say to him. Now I just want to mention, Shebna is said to be the head of the household. And it's interesting that if you go to other scriptures where Shebna is mentioned, and there's another man mentioned here uh, named Eliakim, for example, um, in Isaiah 36, starting in verse 1, says, In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. And there came out to him Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. So here we see Shebna as the secretary, and we see Eliakim as over the household. So going back here to Isaiah 22, this is a prophecy God gives Isaiah to go to Shebna. Come, go to this steward to Shebna, who is over the household, and say to him, What have you to do here? And whom have you here, that you have cut out here a tomb for yourself? 
you who cut out a tomb on the height and carve a dwelling for yourself in the rock. See, Shebna had begun to think too highly of himself. Behold, I am will hurl you away violently, O you strong man. He will seize firm hold on you and whirl you around and around and throw you like a ball into a wide land. There you shall die, and there shall be your glorious chariots, you shame of your master's house. Wow, does the head of a household have glorious chariots? I will thrust you from your office, and you will be pulled down from your station. And that day I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe, and will bind your sash on him, and will commit your authority to his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. So evidently, by Isaiah 36, Shebna had already been demoted and Eliakim had been raised up into his position. But there's way more going on here. This is a prophecy. This is a parable. Then in verse 22 it says, And I will place on his shoulder, that's on Eliakim, the key of the house of David, He shall open, and none shall shut. He shall shut, and none shall open. And I will fasten him like a peg in in a secure place, and he will become a throne of honor to his father's house. And they will hang on him the whole honor of his father's house, the offspring and issue, every small vessel from the cups to all the flagons. In that day, declares I am of hosts, The peg that was fastened in a secure place will give way. That's talking of Shebna. And it will be cut down and fall, and the load that was on it will be cut off, for I am has spoken. So what is happening here is, in a parable, Shebna is Satan, and Eliakim is Jesus. And so Jesus is identifying himself here as the one who has the key of David. Well, when you're over a household, you have the key to every door. If you open a door, it stays open. If you shut a door and and lock it, it stays locked. So the head of a household is the one who has authority over the house. And Jesus by saying that he has the key of David, is identifying himself as the head of the house, the Lord of the house. Now there's a scripture that talks about this, and that's in Hebrews chapter 3. So let's go to that and read that. Hebrews 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers... You who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. So, see, Jesus is identifying himself as the head of the house, the one with the key to all the doors, the one who opens the doors. Then he goes on in verse 8 to give the specific word to Philadelphia. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied 
my name. I know you have but little power. Now remember in the last several videos, I've been talking about certain groups of men, super apostles, Paul called them, who have gone out proclaiming that they have great power and that they're doing mighty miracles in the name of God. My discernment tells me that they are false apostles, just as Paul's told him that the men he was talking about were false apostles. Now, how can I say that? On what authority do I base that, one who walks in little power? Because I totally identify with this Philadelphian church. Jesus says, I know that you have but little power. Oh yeah, I have no power. So far as I know, I have no power. I can't heal a butterfly. I can't lay my hands and heal the sick. You know, as much as I want to and as much as I've wanted to for 46 years, I have no power. But, yet, you have kept my word and have not denied my name. You have not contradicted me. You have not contradicted my name. What did he say to the previous church, to the Sardis? Let's read again what he said there. Now remember, he started with the Philadelphians, verse 8, I know your works. He started with the church in Sardis, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Jesus doesn't say anything like that to the church in Philadelphia. But to Sardis, right after he says that the works are not complete, he says, remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. Okay, remember what you received, what you heard. Remember the word of God. Remember the scriptures. Remember the truths in God's word and walk according to that truth. Don't make things up. Don't say you're Superman when you're not. Don't think you're, you're making decrees in the heavenly courts when you're not. Don't pretend. Be who you are. Walk according to the word of God to the best of your ability. That's what he's telling the Philadelphians and that's what he commends in them. But then to the Sardis, he says this. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, if you will not keep my word and repent, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. But Philadelphia is totally different. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. So he's using his key, the key of David, to open the door. And when you look at, in the scripture, to references to an open door, you'll see that an open door is a place, is a, an opportunity of ministry, an opportunity of walking out the word of God. So God will bring us various things to do. And then when we see the open door, we discern it, pray about it, and go through the door. There was one instance in Scripture where Paul says he had an open door, but he had no peace because he was waiting for Titus and Titus hadn't, had not arrived. And so Paul did not go through the open door. So there are times that you may have an open door where you just don't have peace to go through it. That happened with Paul. So we are to learn to discern the open doors, pray about the open doors, 
and then go through the open door as we're led by the Spirit of God to go through that open door. When we go through an open door, then we perform a good work. And the scripture is full of references to good works. And James says that faith without works is dead. But do you know what the very first elementary doctrine is in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6? Repentance from dead works. And you know what the second one is? Faith in God. But the first elementary doctrine in the book of Hebrews is that we repent of dead works. Do you know what a dead work is? I'll give you a good example from my experience. I was in a church once where um, everyone was encouraged to go into the inner city of St. Louis, knock on doors, and tell people about Jesus. Well, I did that, and it was a dead work. Another one that uh, we did, one day we uh, packed up a huge piano. It may have been a grand piano, and I was one of the people who helped lift it, put it into a truck, went to a park, St. Louis Park, and... Um, Got out the piano and, you know, our preacher was there and, you know, several of us who were involved in the church. That was it. It was another dead work. You know, when we come up with ideas that we think are what God would want us to do, we have to be very careful. It's so easy to spend your entire life doing dead works. It took me years to discern dead works and then just not be part of them, to quit playing a part in dead works. Then in verse 9, Jesus says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Now, who are these Jews? Most people believe that he's talking about the ancient Jews of Israel you know, the, the Jewish people, the Israelites. But what does Paul say? In Romans chapter 2, verse 28, he says this, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. In other words, no one is a Jew simply because he came from the line of Judah or from the line of Abraham. A Jew is one inwardly. Well, what, what's the word that we use for Jews now? Christian. But unfortunately for Christians, for many Christians now, it's simply outward. We simply say we're a Christian because we believe certain doctrines about Jesus and think that that's all we have to do. But it hasn't become a matter of the heart for most Christians, just as it was not a matter of the heart for most Jews after the flesh. But see, Paul is redefining a Jew. A Jew is a believer in Christ. A Jew is one who is one inwardly because he knows that Jesus is his Savior. And a true Jew is one whose heart has been circumcised by the Spirit of God so that he now does 
the things of God, that he actually becomes, is becoming hagios, holy, just as Jesus is holy. So, when Jesus speaks here to the Philadelphians, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I believe he's talking about Christians. The synagogues of Satan today, as they were then, are the churches, the false churches, the churches that say one thing and do another. The churches that have doctrines that are totally opposed to the doctrines of Jesus, to the Word of God. And what is Jesus going to do? He's going to make these people come and bow down before the feet of those who have kept his word and have not denied his name. Now, there's several references in the book of Isaiah concerning people who will bow down to the feet of his overcomers. And one of those is found in Isaiah chapter 60. Now I'm going to read actually Isaiah 60 through 62 because this is such a poignant area in Scripture that's talking about the time that we are entering into. So Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of I Am has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. That is where we are now. Darkness covers the earth, thick darkness covers the people. A veil of darkness has covered the people, and they cannot discern the truth. But I am will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you, and nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. This is going to happen very soon when the overcomers of God are glorified. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The sea is speaking of all mankind. The abundance of all mankind shall be turned to the overcomers. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Epah. So this is speaking figuratively of various peoples. All those from Sheba will come, they shall bring gold and frankincense. They shall bring good news, the praises of I Am. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nabaoth shall minister to you. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar, and I will beautify my beautiful house. Here we're talking about the house. Jesus shows himself as the master of the house with the key of David. Who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves to their windows? For the coastlands shall hope for me, the ships of Tarshish first, to bring your children from afar, their silver and gold with them, for the name of I am your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has made you beautiful. Foreigners shall build up your walls, and their kings shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I have had mercy on you. All sons of God have been disciplined by God in order to be made into his image. Your gates shall be open continually. Day and night they shall not be shut. Now he's alluding to the fact that the overcomers become New Jerusalem. 
So he's using words speaking of the city of New Jerusalem that we see in Revelation 21 and 22. He's using figurative language to speak of the overcomers. Your gates shall be open continually. Day and night they shall not be shut. That people may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve you shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly laid waste. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the plain, and the pine, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. And then here now is the prophecy Jesus alluded to. The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you. See, we are being afflicted now. The people of God are utterly afflicted by the powers that be and the horrible things they're doing to us in this earth. And all who despise you shall bow down at your feet. They shall call you the city of I Am, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. New Jerusalem, this is talking about New Jerusalem. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated, with no one passing through, no one listens, no one listens to the overcomer, no one listens to the man of God, no one, no one listens to the truth of God's word. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated, with no one passing through, no one listening, I will make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age. You shall suck the milk of nations, you shall nurse at the breast of kings, and you shall know that I, I am, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold, and instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze, instead of stones, iron. I will make your overseers peace and your taskmasters righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and call your gates praise. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. These are all spoken of again in the book of Revelation in the description of New Jerusalem. But I am will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down nor your moon withdraw itself. For I am will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified, that God may be glorified. God is doing this for his glory. The least one shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am, I am. In its time, I will hasten it. And now we come to chapter 61. And this is how Jesus introduced himself when he began his ministry. He read from this scripture. The spirit of the Lord I am is upon me because I am has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of I am's favor. Then he stopped and he said, Today, in your hearing, the scripture has been fulfilled. And the people rose to stone him. And eventually they killed him. But he stopped right at the beginning of verse 2. It goes on. He said to proclaim the year of I am's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. It was not yet time for that, but now it is time. We are at the end of this age. To comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of I am that he may be glorified. They, so these people, these overcomers, they shall build up the ancient ruins. 
They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. See, our civilization is ruined. It's being judged. And um, God put it in the heart of the eighth head of the beast to destroy Babylon the Great, which was, is man's city, man's wicked city that needed to be judged. And it's being judged. Don't you find it strange that our leaders are destroying their own nations? That our leaders are killing their own people? Don't you find that strange? God put it in the heart of the beast to do that. Verse 5. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of I am. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, honor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For I am, I love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are an offspring of I am, that I am has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in I am. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord I am will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. See, the great revival happens after the overcomers are glorified. Then chapter 62. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of I am will give. And it just so happens that one of the promises to the church of Philadelphia is that God will give them a new name. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of I am, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her, and your land shall be called married. For I am delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. There is a time coming when the overcomers will see reconciliation with all of those who have rejected them. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen. All the day and all the night they shall never be silent. You who put I am in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. Until he establishes New Jerusalem, give him no rest. Lord, establish New Jerusalem. We pray in the name of Jesus. We pray that you will glorify your overcomers and raise them up to restore this earth, to, to restore the ru ruined cities the devastations in this earth, to destroy the wicked from within this world. I am has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm. I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies, and foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored. But those who garner it shall eat it, and praise I am. And those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones, lift up a signal over the peoples. Behold, I am has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your salvation comes, 
Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of I am. And you shall be called sought out a city not forsaken. It's not said here in Isaiah 62, 12, but you will be called New Jerusalem. See, one of the great heresies of the church is Zionism, Christian Zionism, and supporting a lawless Zionistic state over in ancient Israel that is very much part and parcel of the destruction going on in the earth today. Then we come to this in... Uh, Verse 10 of chapter 3 of Revelation. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. What is... God's word about patient endurance. Well, in Matthew 24, the entire chapter is dealing with Christ's prophecy concerning the time we live in. In 24.9 through 13, he says this, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Many super apostles, super prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Then he says, way down in verse 42, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Well, see, that's why he rebuked, one of the reasons why he rebuked Sardis is he said in verse 3 if you will not wake up I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you but then to the Philadelphians he says this because you have kept my word about patient endurance in other words they were awake they were filled with oil there are the five wise virgins that we see in Matthew chapter 25 in that parable. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, because you have kept yourself filled with oil, because you have kept yourself washed with the word, because you have eaten my food, says Christ, because you have eaten me, that you have eaten my flesh and drunk my blood, you have taken my word into you because you have kept my word. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I will keep you from the hour of trial. There's not coming a great revival before the hour of trial. I believe this is speaking of the glorification of the man-child that you see in Revelation chapter 12, who become the mountains of 
Israel, where Jesus tells his people to flee to in Matthew 24. And that the virgins who were not filled with oil will have an opportunity to go and become full of oil over the next three and a half years. Now that will be a revival for them, but it's not going to be the glorious thing that they're thinking of. So Jesus promises this church, the Philadelphians, to keep them from the hour of trial. And then in verse 11, he says, I am coming soon. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Well, what is the crown? It's the crown of life. It's the crown of righteousness. Their names are written in the book of life. But this sounds like it's possible even for them to have their name blotted from that book. If they somehow allow someone to seize their crown. What that means is that we have to endure to the end. We can't just sit back upon what we already know to be true, think that we have obtained our crown when we haven't yet obtained it. There comes a time I think when we will know that we have obtained it. Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, said he had not yet obtained his crown, even though he was working to obtain it. It's in chapter 2 of Philippians where Paul says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. And of course, that's dealing with the salvation of our soul. And then it see if I think I have it. Second Timothy chapter four, verse six, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So, we may think that we're doing okay, and I hope that we are. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. What you have. I have little power. But I have 
the word of God. Hold fast what you have. The one who overcomes, the one who holds fast what he has. See, he says to the Philadelphians, you have kept my word and have not denied my name. That's what we have. To the one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What Jesus is talking about here is total identification with him. A pillar in the temple, identification with the name of God, identification with the name of the city of God, New Jerusalem, that name is written on him. God's name is written on him. And Jesus' new name is written on him. Total identification with our God. That's for the overcomer. For those of us who will hold fast to what we have. Who keep Christ's word and who do not deny his name.